interesting question. Well, people seem to believe that the invisible hand of the market, the great capitalist dream, brings the cream to the top, that the best artists are being discovered. Well, here's a stat. In the last 10 years in New York galleries, in influential, the best New York galleries, only 20% of the artists that have shown have been women. So unless you believe men are better at art than women, certainly it's not a meritocracy that's being produced. It's not great for artists. Although a few artists win the lottery, like Damien Hirst, the rest of artists do part-time jobs, sell no art. 95% of them do things like working as assistants for Damien Hirst. And when the economy goes down or when White Cube fires them, they have to try and find another menial part-time job. Artists aren't benefiting from art fairs. Who has the power with art fairs? Is it the artists? Is it them who are the VIPs who go in first to the art fair? No, it's the collectors. It's the guy who, before he was an art collector, he collected Star Wars figures or fine wines or vintage cars. <laughs> it's those people who the galleries pander to. It's they who are the most important people because they have the money that buys the art, that pays the bills, that pays for the money to get your 6,000 pound stool in freeze. Um, if you think hedge fund managers are the best people to run the art world, then you may have seen what they've done to the economy. <laughs> it's corrupting of art as well. If you want to be in an art fair as an artist, you have to produce a standard product. You have to do something consistent, because no one wants to buy a piece of art if next year the artist does something different. So you have to carry on working in the same way with the same work. And if you speak to artists, it's one of the worst aspects the lucky few who actually sell their work, they're stuck selling the same thing and churning out the same type of art with their team of assistants. And finally, it's not a fair or a free market. Um, the selection committee for the 2009 Freeze Art Fair, Gavin Brown, director of Gavin Brown's Enterprise, Daniel Buchholz, gallery Daniel Buchholz, Sadie Coles, director of Sadie Coles, Marcia Fortes, director, Toby Webster, director of a gallery. They're all galleries in Freeze. It's a cartel. It's the people who run the shop, who run the art fair, choosing the other people who can come into the magic circle and be able to sell their work and get the status of being in that art fair. So it's neither a free market nor a fair market. And yet it promotes itself as having, I quote from the Freeze website, the leading artists, the exhibiting galleries representing the most exciting contemporary art galleries working today. Well, actually, they're the galleries that are the best galleries at selling work, and they're led in by the other galleries. It's like the OPEC cartel. Finally. And this is maybe the uh, saddest part of being in part of the art world, is that you end up spending your entire time sucking up to rich people. <laughs> and he who pays the piper calls the tune. It's not cost neutral. You might think that in every business you have to suck up to rich people and powerful people. But those people, their taste, their choices become what art is. Those people are sit on the museum boards. Those people choose the galleries for freeze. Those people decide which artists can earn a living from being artists. And they, don't, they may not have some sinister agenda, but their agenda is those of a very few rich people who are not the same as all of us, not the same as the artists. Well, all of us, I, people like me, artists. So I didn't become an artist to make lots of money. I could have been a lawyer, as my dad always says. I actually really love looking at art and thinking about art and seeing art. And I think art fairs, the big problem is that the artists are the sort of bottom of the heap, bottom of the hierarchy, and, and money makes artists servants. Money should be the servant of artists. And artists should have the power, not a few rich people, not a few important people. The first people in the art world who should have power are artists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasper Joff. I was hoping for a heated debate, and with you, Jasper, we are well on our way, so that's fantastic. <laughs> so now, in, in perfect timing, we have Matthew Slotover, founder of Freeze Art Fair. <laughs> Well, since Jasper was so heated, I think I should answer one or two of his points. Um, interesting, that question about uh, women artists and using that as a reason why the commercial art market you know, doesn't 
represent the best artists. I'm just looking at Jasper's fair. How many women artists are here, Jasper? F out of 55, 16, I think it is here. You know, so you haven't exactly done your bit. Um, and I also wanted to answer the point about um, uh, the selection committee. That's a, that's a really interesting, interesting one. We, th we think it's the fairest way for galleries to select uh, their, own, their own kind, if you like. Um, and the galleries get criticized in two points. If a gallery doesn't get into the fair who's friends with the gallery and who shares artists with them, they say, I didn't get in because they think I'm competition and they don't want me in there. If they don't know the gallery and they don't share the artist, they say, I didn't get in because I'm not part of their gang. So the poor selection committee, they have a difficult job to do, uh, but uh, do we think this is the fairest way of doing a fair? Um, you can always criticize it, but we think they know the galleries best. And since I'm the only one here who, who really works on the art fair, um, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were an artist. Um, <laughs> I, I hope, as with Jasper, you'll forgive me for talking a bit about what I do and giving some examples from, from the fair. Uh, I know Jasper did. Um, a couple of anecdotes. At the first art fair in 2003, uh, visitors walking around would encounter a gallery stand, uh, empty but apart from two young children. Children walked up to visitors and recited a list of artworks uh, by Tino Segal. Tino's works are not paintings or sculptures, but situations that the buyer can then enact. At times, the children would ask visitors questions, and, and visitors would ask the children questions. But if visitors tried to photograph them, they complained that photographing the work was not appropriate, and they'd fall to the floor. Segal's work takes the tradition of conceptual art, pushes it a step further, and it really forces us to consider what the limits and the definition of art is, and makes us experience art in a completely new, new way. For every, almost everyone at the fair who saw, who saw the work, this is the first time they'd experienced it had a huge impact on me and lots of people who saw it. Such is the impact of a piece that he has soon offered exhibitions in galleries and museums. And two weeks ago, he ended a six-week solo exhibition at New York's Guggenheim, where, he, where they hope he got rave reviews. Now, being that Guggenheim is not the only monitor of success, but it certainly is a major monitor of success. And if you'd come to Freeze that year, uh, seven years ago, you would have seen that work first. That would have been the first place to experience his work. There's another example. Um, in 2006, Mike Nelson created a whole labyrinth of rooms constructed behind gallery booths, revealing a deserted dark room with photographs documenting the build of the fair. The installation was deliberately not signposted. A couple of unmarked white doors led to it. You either had to know about it or stumble into it. Only a few hundred people did. But Roberta Smith in the New York Times, when she was talking about her top 10 memorable events of the year globally, uh, mentioned this piece as one of the top 10. Uh, that the next year he was shortlisted for the Turner Prize, partly as a result of this piece at the fair. I could name more. Uh, Rob Pruitt made a flea market at the fair. Paolo Pivi had a grass slope that you could, you could, uh, you could, you could roll down. Elm Grin and Dragset did a double gallery booth where half of it absolutely replicated the other half, so you walk park it like a, like a deja vu. Uh, Roman on Dex Q, uh, Louise has mentioned already. Uh, Chris Martin did a one-minute silence during the opening of the fair. There's, ma there's many more. My only point really here is that you can see great art at art fairs. I'm the first to admit that art fairs are not the ideal place to look at art. They're not museums. They're not galleries. It is impossible to see everything. And there are a lot of other people there getting in the way. But this is more than made up for by the huge range of art on display. But you don't get that opportunity anywhere else in the world to see such a range um, globally and by so many artists. Art fairs are places where art is bought and sold. That is their primary aim. And Richard has talked about the anxiety around, uh, around art being bought and sold. And this really, I think you're right, is the crux of, of the discussion. And one that is, a, it's, it's kind of too long complicated to go into here. Um, my general feeling on the market is that it's a positive thing. It allows artists to pay their studio bills and make art. And anything that does that can only be good. It also, it's also the contemporary Robin Hood. It takes from the rich that Jasper hates so much and gives to the poor, who are the artists. But does this mean art fairs are just about money? I don't think so. We do surveys of freeze of visitors, and 85% of the visitors to the fair say they're not there to buy, they're there to look. They're there to see the art, and that's what they're there to do. 
I think that's the final proof for the motion. Thank you. Question about um, <clears throat> fairs and money and their relationship to art is raised. These, uh, this is a very fundamental question about what the use of art is, why we have it, why in this country we very recently signed up to pretending to like it. Are we going to go on spouting ignorantly and clapping uh, because of the sort of social climbing values that Matthew and his magazine and fair stand for? Or, or are we going to uh, think about the thing itself, about art itself, and you know, what's the point of it? Um, uh, long ago in this country, we <clears throat> uh, didn't have anything to do with it, really. We laughed at it and we sneered at it, and it really was the domain of the wealthy. Uh, and recently, there's been a great social change uh, with a lot of confusion about wealth and values, and art, in a way, is a barometer uh, of those confusions. We go to um, uh, the Freeze Art Fair in order to not be Philistines, and in order to, be, to partake in the sort of the culture of our own moment. And, and we realize, because of uh, many signals that we receive through the media, through chat, through the ether, that uh, it would be ignorant to um, put down the appalling drivel that um, art gallery people spout at you when you ask them about their awful art in, in Freeze Art Fair, the illiterate nonsense that they speak. And we have to say, oh, yes, oh, that probably is very good. And, and, uh, <laughs> what, wasn't there a time when uh, art had sort of, sort of something serious to say and was connected to something fundamental in, in our being? and wasn't sort of wholly identified with consumerism, as it is at the Freeze Art Fair, and, uh, which, which Matthew sort of invented and was so lamely defending just now. But uh, <laughs> what, is, what is fabulous about, about the Freeze Art Fair is the first 10 minutes of utter stimulation. When you go around there and you see a lot of new hot stuff, the stuff that is striving to be like the latest successful financial model. And uh, after 10 minutes of that slightly that, that mixture of um, joy and unpleasant stimulation. <laughs> One feels a bit sort of depressed, followed by a sadness and uh, a re real sort of uh, empty feeling. But what the fair is very good at providing is a lot of sort of outreach programs that compensate for the fair's essential horribleness. <laughs> um, and that is things like what Ma Matthew just described, you know, various installations and discussions and chats where um, somebody will get up and intellectualize or do something a bit off the consumerist mainstream track. And there we have the real problem of the matter. You know, the, the, the very question, you know, art fairs are more about money than art. The answer is built into the proposal. You know, a fair is a fair. It's a, by definition, is about trade uh, and money. Um, so that at a fair, art somehow is connected to the thing that is most weak about it, and that is the fact that it has to sell. What is most strong about it is found elsewhere, in other contexts, the art gallery or the museum, or reading a book about art, or if you're lucky enough to make a visit to a, an artist's studio. Um, of course, an art fair is one of the ways in which people encounter art. It's a recently um, revved up phenomenon that, that we've all started to enjoy. But all I'm saying is not that it's hell or that it's the, it's the worst thing that ever happened. I'm saying it's the worst in the list of the ways of encountering art because of its essential selling nature. That consumerism is not the thing that art is about. Art is an antidote to consumerism. And you're always looking for antidotes, marvellous, uh, profound uh, and glorious antidotes to the problems and the seediness and the creepiness of life. You don't want... Uh, the dark side of existence to be confirmed by art. Uh, as Matthew, as Matthew in all his loveliness, has just confirmed. And uh, Norman often mistakes the sort of thrills of embracing darkness with, with, with the sort of essential banality of the boredom of consumerism. So I'm saying to you all, please do vote the right way because it matters a lot in, in, in terms of your consciousness of what art is, what it's for, why we have it, why it is useful to us. We know that socially and economically it is only there, actually, to keep a market going. 
But in terms of philosophy and spirit and what it feels like to be alive and the short time we have on earth, it's there for very other, very different reasons. And so we want to um, really applaud the things that art can do that are absolutely nothing to do with fairs. And we do not want to celebrate the uh, nonsense and sleazy sadness that uh, I'm, my unfortunate <laughs> deluded colleagues on the wrong side of the panel are here tonight to, to sell to you in some kind of creepy way. So uh, th uh, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>Thank you so much, Matthew Collings. And now, as the last speaker uh, to speak against the motion, we have Sir Norman Rosenthal. I hate art fairs. I hate going to them. Hmm? But listen to the motion. Art fairs, all about money, not about art. Well, of course just not true, for a start. And secondly, one of the things that I always say is that there's no moral imperative to be involved with art. But if you are involved with art, and there are all sorts of different ways of being involved with art, it is a wonderful way of living your life. And art fairs are a part of that. I mean, it's one way of encountering art. It's not the only way. If you only go to freeze art fair, or if you're some Central European uh, super rich person, only go to Basel, or if you're some South American uh, crook and you only go to Miami, that is not being involved with art. That certainly is not big. But on the other hand, art fairs are an extraordinary forum for seeing a great deal of art and also supporting artists because artists, lots and lots of artists get, you know, uh, when I was young, the art world, for example, in London, was incredibly tiny. There were two kind of what you might loosely call avant-garde or new art galleries in London. One was the Listen Gallery, the other was Nigel Greenwood. That was all there was. About a hundred people would be kind of involved in this world. You would go, and I mean, if you weren't at the opening, people would say, where are, where, why weren't you at the opening? I mean, now the art world has hundreds of galleries in London. Hundreds, art has suddenly become, for better or worse, a huge global industry. And there's no way you can escape that. And even my dear friend over there, who I don't, alas, I haven't met, Mr. Joff, he knows that perfectly well as well. Art is a global industry with endless thousands and thousands of people participating it, participating in this industry in many, many different ways. And one of the ways that one participates in this kind of world is, of course, through the art fair. It is, of course, not the only way I mean, for example, if I can just speak for myself. About a year ago, I went to see a wonderful... I chanced upon a wonderful exhibition in an art gallery in Vilma Gold, as it happens. You know, one, the gallery that one goes to in London. And I saw a wonderful artist there called Stephen Rhodes, who had a huge, big installation, which would, if it were in this gallery, would more than fill this space. And then I happened to be in Miami, where I was invited... Perhaps I shouldn't have gone. Very immoral of me to go to Miami. I won't tell you what I got up to in Miami. <laughs> but, you know, I happened to, at one of the minor fringe art fairs to see an incredible, beautiful work by this guy, Stephen Rhodes. And he was, a, he was an incredibly interesting artist. And within this work of art, is an artist who I think is very extraordinary, a young artist who uh, somehow is very engaged, both with, in a kind of Rauschenbergian way, but in a neo-Rauschenbergian way, with... Uh, American history. And I saw a very, very beautiful object, which I thought I could cope with in my own way, uh, quite relatively small, a very beautiful object. And of course, I bought this work of art. I could just about afford it. I went to the art fair. I said, Norman, under no circumstances will you buy any work, art. But I like supporting artists, and I like supporting things. And, you know, since I've left the Royal Academy, I earn a good deal more money. You know, uh, than I did before. You know, now that I'm in re retire now I'm retired from the Royal Academy and I'm a freelance person, I earn a little bit of money and I'm very happy to put some of that money back into the world of art and to support young artists. It gives me huge, huge pleasure. And I'm now engaged in a dialogue with this artist as I am with many artists in that way. 
And I think it's the dialogue of artists and encountering things, and there are many, many different places in which you can encounter works of art. And it's a kind of full-time job to encounter works of art. You can encounter, of course, you can go from gallery to... You need to go from gallery to gallery to gallery. And in the old days, people used to go to the summer exhibition of the Royal Academy. And, the, you know, the, the, the vicars used to come up from, uh, from Oxfordshire uh, with their wives. And they used to think, by going to the Royal Ac summer exhibition of the Royal Academy, I'm interested in art. Of course they weren't interested in art. To be interested in art is a full-time job. And, of course, you go to biennales and you go to art fairs. And, I mean, it does provide you with a huge amount of information about this very funny thing called art. Art is not something you can say. I don't know what art is, but I recognize it when I see it. And, of course, it's partly subjective, and partly it has to do with a kind of general consensus, you know? So that, uh, that's one of the beauties of being with art. And to be with art is a wonderful thing to do. And I do think that art fairs are certainly about money. Of course they're about money, because we, as, as Richard himself said, we, you know... Our uh, whole world is about money, and if Mr. Joff doesn't think, I don't know how he supports himself, but I imagine as an artist, he has to support himself, and he's very happy if, as an artist, somebody buys his work or gets hold of his art in some shape or form. And, of course, if you can get it for free, fantastic. I mean, I wish I'd known about his art and gone and found my Marlena Dumas or, indeed...